we are now in our third week till now what we have done we have looked at how information is brought to the brain how the brain assigns a meaning to it based on our uh, experiences that come to us how do we learn certain things now we are moving to the next step that is once the information comes to us and we realize that there is a need for us to store it for little longer time for future usage okay future usage could be say couple of seconds from now or it could be you know even in the lifetime sometime so future is you no know, quite broad in that sense so when you realize that i need to store this information for little longer i can use it in uh, maybe couple of seconds couple of minutes from now or i might need this information much later in my life which is valuable for me then we try to store it and if we have successfully stored it then whenever needed we will like to retrieve it okay if the process of storage works well if we succeed you know retrieving it uh, from the storage this is what is called as memory and in this third week we would be exclusively focusing on the uh, concepts that has to do with human memory processes okay now memory is basically studied in terms of mental processes that are involved in storing and retrieving information now remember before memory we have talked about learning the distinction between the two is that learning basically emphasizes on acquisition whereas memory basically focuses on the retention and the retrieval of uh, the information so if you acquire uh, information that is what learning looks at if you are more interested in terms of retaining the information and uh, retrieving it whenever you ne need it then this is the part of memory so storage retrieval these are two important constructs that we would be looking at now memory system it stores information acquired through our sense modalities how the sense modalities they help our brain in terms of uh, you know perceiving things that we have already discussed in the first week now these informations which come to the brain might qualify to be stored for relatively longer time and therefore memory consists of many systems ranging from storage duration and buffer storage which primarily will take the information to the long term storage okay so depending on the fraction of second to lifetime uh, duration of storage we will further classify you know uh, memory into different subtypes that exercise we will continue doing uh, till the end therefore memory basically is our cognitive system which is used for storing and retrieving the information okay with this uh, basic uh, information about memory let us understand what actually we are going to do as part of this very uh, you know uh, discussion deliberation for this full week we would be trying to understand what memory is we would be looking at some of the dominant theories which tries to explain how human uh, storage system works how the retrieval process works then we would be trying to understand that why is it important for human beings to memorize information why memory plays that important role and given the fact that memory plays uh, no such important role uh, how many types of uh, no retrieval and storage processes are there one is of course based on the timeline whether you uh, know uh, store the information for few seconds little longer or much more longer okay or depending on how you truncate it you have the information which runs for a certain duration of time and then depending on certain qualities you truncate it so this would lead to know all types of uh, storage of information okay the strategies that we use and then we will come to the reverse of memory reverse of memory would basically be the process called forgetting if you commit error no in terms of storing information or you have stored the information 
but then you commit an error in terms of retrieving it. Think of uh, you know, uh, something like this, you are uh, you know, searching for a paper that you have filed in your cabinet. Okay? Your filing cabinet has that uh, specific paper that you are searching for that you are very sure about, but when you search for it you have you know, all types of problems. Okay? Maybe uh, that people, uh, some people give uh, proper file names where they will put, put such type of documents. So, they would only look for those file names, once they find the file name they will turn the pages and identify the paper, this could be one. The other situation could be that you make a random search and even in memory we will see that random search actually does not work. Okay. Uh, some people might even go for you know, um, ordering things, you know, putting things in certain orders, in certain hierarchy that also works very well. Then you also might you know, uh, uh, file the document based on uh, its relevance, whether you would need it in the coming days, you, whether you would know, need it you know, uh, in longer duration, uh, papers which you think are redundant, you will never need it depending on your classificatory scheme, you will put the paper accordingly. Same is the story with the memory processes also. Life experiences, all the information that comes to you depending on several, several, several parameters, we try to uh, give it a code, we try to store it and the coding is needed because the brain understands a particular type of uh, a language. Storage, again you need uh, to store it for longer time and also you need to give it a proper file name, so that when you want to retrieve this information you can just search for that specific file name and get the information. So, from that perspective if you look at the memory process, memory has three distinct processes encoding, storage and retrieval. Now, encoding basically is the process of transformation of a physical stimulus in a form that human memory accepts. Now, uh, if I am looking at the camera right now, okay, there is uh, no certain form okay, and I perhaps have some idea of uh, uh, what type of function this form uh, performs and based on this utility or based on this form, I create an impression. Okay. I know that if I see an object like this, what this should be called. I know that if I want a function like this to be performed, what is the instrument that I would need. Okay. So, this is the process of encoding. Storage of course, is the process of retention. The encoded information has reached the brain and now that encoded piece of uh, information, the brain will retain it with itself. Remember, storage would require a specific file name. It is just like we save files in our computers. Okay. Uh, say for instance, if I have to deliver a lecture on memory and if I uh, make a PowerPoint presentation, okay, I might uh, know, love to give it a name, the file name memory, because this will help me a lot in terms of uh, know, making search for where exactly is my PPT presentation that I have to use today. If I have say 126 PowerPoint presentations with me making random search will make my life help. So, how you uh, you know uh, encode the information and how precisely, how nicely, how customized the file name you provide to the information uh, that you have stored that plays a very crucial role. And this crucial role comes into play when you try to recover the information that you have stored. Okay. So, encoding, storage and retrieval are three distinct processes which are of extreme relevance to memory processes. Two uh, models we would discuss, one the Atkinson and Schifrin model that was proposed in 1968, which tried to uh, know, explain memory in a trifurcated format saying that we have sensory memory, short term memory and long term memory. Memory starts with a sensory input received from the environment. This input is retained for a very brief time ranging from 0.25 seconds to 2 seconds. Some of these inputs are attended and rehearsed, 
such input pass on to short term memory. The unattended inputs are not transferred to short term memory and are forgotten. The inputs can be held in the short term memory for 20 to 30 seconds. If they are further rehearsed, they pass on to long term memory. The unrehearsed ones are forgotten. The inputs moving to the long term memory are organized into categories. They may remain here for days, months or even lifelong and can be retrieved as and when needed. Decay and interference are some of the factors that lead to loss of information from a long term storage. Because the Atkinson and Schifferin's model, they talked about the trifurcated structure of uh, memory, okay, just uh, looking at it from a temporal point of view, okay, sensory short term and long term. Another theory was proposed by Craig and Lockhart in uh, 1972, which further got revised by Telving. And Craig and Telving came forward with a revised version in 1975. According to this model, the incoming information can be processed at three different levels, perceptual level, structural level and semantic level. At perceptual level, one becomes aware of the immediate environment. The structural level is somewhat deeper compared to the perceptual level. Here one emphasizes the structural features of the information. The deepest level of processing is the semantic level. Here one derives profound meaning of the information. This model explicates that deeper the processing, more is the elaboration. In other words, deeper and meaningful analysis leads to durable memory of the information. Higher the elaboration, more are the chances that the newly derived meaning integrates with the existing memories. Now you have seen the difference between the two models. The first model which tried to look at memory in terms of the three types of uh, structures based on its uh, temporal programming. The second model which was more looking in terms of the elaboration process, okay, whether you look at the information only from a perceptual point of view or whether you look at the information from a structural point of view or whether you go for an extensive elaboration, okay, thereby suggesting that the more and more you elaborate perhaps you uh, understand things better. And if you have more, if you have more of you no know, semantic meaningfulness driven type of a memory, okay, you will store it better. The third uh, perspective on memory is what is called as the neural network perspective. Now, neural network basically you know talks about uh, you know the uh, groups of modules. So, it says uh, that there are various modules which form a group. Okay. And these modules basically they help perform simultaneous functions. Memory is nothing according to the neural uh, network perspective, but it is formation or strengthening of these interconnections which gets uh, formed between different modules. Okay. Now, the activation and the spreading they are the two central components uh, from the neural network perspective related to memory. So, what happens? You uh, get the information from the external environment, you encode the information, okay. you have modules which would be entertaining those uh, encoded information and once the traces are formed, when you repeat it the second time, it gets strengthened. Okay. Now, two or more modules, they get interconnected. And this formation, if it is repeated, it gets strengthened. When you activate it, okay, you are able to store the information. Okay. Now, more and more is the you know, formation of the module, more and more is the connectivity between different different modules, the more spreading takes place. Okay. You have better memory. So, there is a spread of uh, this strengthened associations. The stronger the association, the more wider the uh, network, okay, better would be the memory. And when you activate it, this is how the memory system gets operationalized. This is the neural network perspective. Now that we have discussed uh, three important concepts, you know, the model given by Atkinson and Schifferin, the model given by Craig and Lockhart, which further got revised uh, in collaboration with Telving, and the neural network perspective, if we combine 
all these information and try to evolve a comprehensive model of memory. So, what is memory all about? How does our memory function? Okay. This is how we would explain it. This is what you get. If you summarize the existing knowledge on memory system, then our sensory register mostly gets information from the visual, auditory and the haptic senses. The rehearsed information then moves to the short term memory system. Those encoded and rehearsed further move to the long term memory system. Depending on our decision to respond to the environment, we use certain retrieval strategies to get the desired information from the long term storage. The response outputs are mediated by our working memory. Now, let us go back to our first week. What we discussed there was that visual, uh, kinesthetic, somesthetic, vestibular, auditory, olfactory, okay. all these channels, they are basically meant to provide information to the brain. Given the fact that the brain receives stimulus from all these sensations, Okay. One can think that if memory is guided by the information that comes to the brain, then ideally it should store all type of information. Now, uh, let me give you an example. Say, if your mother for instance, okay, uh, just comes and uh, you know, uh, keeps her palm on your shoulder without hesitation, within fractions you would arrive at a conclusion that it is my mother. Okay. This recollection, you, are, you have not looked at your mother, it is only the touch of the mother which uh, made you uh, identify, make a correct identification that it is your mother. Whereas, if somebody else touches you, you are not able to provide the correct meaning to it. Why? And this gives you a feel that fine, a touch based memory could also exist. Okay. Previously, I was telling you that uh, if I look at a camera and I know this is called camera, okay, the structure, the form, the function both. So, next time if I see this structure, I know this is camera and if I uh, need something to be recorded, I know uh, which instrument can perform this function and then I will say I need a camera. So, it is the visual part, it is the understanding of the mechanism. Uh, now, imagine another situation, you are somewhere you know close to a railway track, you are not able to see a train, but you hear the sound of a moving train. Just with the help of this auditory input, you can sense okay, that fine, this, uh, the source of uh, this very sound is a moving train which perhaps is you know at certain distance from me. Okay. Now, one sound, how does it make you understand that this comes from the train? Again, there must be something that the brain has stored based on the auditory uh, process. Uh, say, uh, somebody gives you something to taste, you put it on the tip of your tongue and say, oh, I remember there is something else also which resembles to this taste or this taste is equivalent to something that uh, you, know, uh, you and the person with whom you are sharing this experience also is aware of. Then you realize that there could be a taste based memory also. Okay. So, what I am basically trying to tell you is that because the brain receives input from all sense modalities you can assume situations and you can very easily identify cases from the real world situation, where your own experience will tell you that this part of my memory is basically guided by the input which has come from a given sense modality. Having said this, let me confess that research in psychology has largely been uh, conducted only using two sense modalities the visual processes and the auditory processes. So, eye and the ear, these are the only two sense modalities through which uh, you know how the information is captured, how it is processed, how it is stored, okay. whole lot of research has gone into it. And the third set of research uh, 
uh, which is not as uh, you know, uh, comparable as uh, the usually or auditorily guided uh, research in a memory is the touch based memory. Rest of the sense modalities they have not been examined as thoroughly as the first two and then the third one. Therefore, we will for our understanding of sensory memory will focus on only three types of memories. No? The sensory memory which has to do with vision that is the iconic memory, sensory memory that has to do with the auditory process that is the echoic memory and the sensory memory that has to do with haptic sensation the touch based sensation. But uh, because uh, largely research has been guided by uh, the iconic and the echoic memory. So, for this very module a 10 hour uh, brief module we would be you know talking exclusively with respect to the iconic and the echoic memory. Iconic and echoic memory basically uh, you know they store visual and auditory information as part of the process involved in perception. Okay. So, eye and ears both are responsible for the process of perception they are the first source the biological entity in our body which receives the signal from the external world. Now, both these sense modalities are distinctive because they allow the initial stimulus to be prolonged. Okay. This means that when the eyes they get activated because the light falls on the retina you remember in perception we had said that the cis state converts into the trans state and again gets back to the cis state because it has to be ready enough to receive the second set of uh, signal. Now, this very transformation okay, the at the level of retina the rod cells and the con cells the light falls and the cis configuration becomes in the trans state the time that it will take to get itself back to the cis state is the time which basically the eye gives to its uh, gives to itself to retain the information for a certain period of time. So, the visual information although it has crossed through the optic track okay, till this uh, no information uh, till this uh, chemical configuration realigns the information is stored at the level of eyes this is iconic memory. Now, recollect what we had discussed about the auditory mechanism. What we discussed was that the sound wave it enters through the middle ear it goes to the inner ear where uh, in the cochlea we have the uh, flute and the wall of the cochlea which has the hair follicles this flute starts shaking thereby making movement in the hair follicles. These hair follicles in turn triggers current in the nerve circuit. Okay this neural circuit finally, uh, is perceived by the brain assigned a meaning and thereby we hear meaningful things in the world. But recollect your other experience of throwing a piece of a stone in a still water okay. or uh, if you do not have that experience recollect the experience of you know uh, collecting uh, water in a bucket uh, that falls from the tap. You close the tap and one or two drops still falls in the bucket and you realize that the ripples create in the water it takes certain time for the ripple to settle down. Okay. Now, convert this to the working mechanism of the ears the cochlea has the flute the flute shakes. So, once the shaking has begun it will take time to slow down and then gradually get it stabilized. So, that would mean that till flute in the cochlea you know, moves the, uh, the hair follicles will also move and till the hair follicle moves ear is capable of retaining the auditory information okay. and this is the source of echoic memory. So, what happens eyes and ears both are now capable of storing the information for a shorter period of time to ensure or to allow you the probability of processing this information at a little later stage okay. and these are the biological foundation of sensory memory especially remember we are talking only with reference to iconic and echoic memory. 
Now, iconic memory that has to do with the eyes can hold information for up to 1 to 2 seconds. Okay. Remember, when we will come to the echoic memory, we would realize that ears are able to store information for little longer period of time compared to eyes. Why? That question we will take up when we come to echoic memory. Now, what happens in the case of iconic memory? Shorter period of time, just 1 to 2 seconds, but then you have longer piece of information, 11 to 16 items can be held right at the level of I for 1 to 2 seconds. You can imagine the capacity of uh, iconic memory. Further, what is far more interesting is to understand the fact that features which are extremely important for us to perceive the world such as color, such as shape, such as direction. Okay. Uh, you remember muller lyer illusion, the example that we took, it had arrow headed line, feather headed line, so direction was there different lines had different colors, entire gestalt principle you know, bubbles that used to come as examples, all of them were colored. So, the shape, color, the direction, all these features can be stored okay. and 11 such information, 11 to 16 such information can be stored right at the level of 5. What would this mean? This would mean that when you saw examples, whether it was a line, whether it was horizontal, whether it was vertical, whether it was a bubble, whether it expanded, whether uh, no, it moved in the what you call uh, vertical direction, diagonally, horizontally, okay. everything you could store right at the level of the eye. So, multiple information up to 2 seconds, this is what happens at the level of eyes and this is called iconic memory. However, our iconic memory has two limitations. First, if you vary the brightness level, okay. once you now change the brightness, then you realize that you know, some degree of masking has taken place. Okay. So, right now the level of brightness was this much, you add one more uh, glowing light or you switch off one more light and you realize that the bra um, brightness pattern has changed. Because in perception also we have discussed this based on uh, you know, uh, the balance between white, gray and black, the perceptual quality changes. Okay. Therefore, two information can get masked, okay. it can interfere. So, this is called brightness masking. Similarly, we can have pattern masking, more than one pattern, if it superimposes, one gets overlaid over the other and you get a combined image of the two, this is this will be called as pattern masking. So, in terms of efficiency, we know 11 to 16 items, color, shape, direction, all such important features for up to 2 seconds, that is the capability of the iconic memory. Limitation, it uh, know, has its limitation when you uh, tamper the brightness level and if you vary the pattern, then also it has certain limitations. Okay. With respect to iconic memory, uh, let us also discuss one of uh, the interesting experiments done by Sperling. Now, uh, 3 to 16 alphanumeric uh, characters were displayed for a shorter period of time okay. and um, performance in terms of memory was compared under two conditions, the whole report condition and the part report condition. Now, in the whole report condition, recall was basically supposed to be done. Okay. Uh, with respect to as many information, as many elements of uh, information uh, that was initially presented, okay, how much the participant is able to recollect. Now, irrespective of the characters displayed, it was realized that only 4 to 5 characters were recollected. Okay. This was the whole report condition, where uh, the recall was supposed to be of maximum possible number of elements. What happened in the case of uh, partial reporting condition? In the partial reporting condition, the participant was basically supposed to identify the subset of the character uh, within the visual display and it was realized that memory was better in this case. So, better memory compared to whole report procedure okay. and partial report uh, also suggested that retention is possible for about 12 characters 
from a 16 character array. So, if this alphanumeric character there were 16 alphanumeric characters 12 at least could be recollected in the partial report condition suggesting that uh, if you are allowed this uh, uh, freedom to go for a partial recall this is a better condition compared to the whole recall condition. Another interesting information uh, of a research not so very old conducted in 2010. Uh, which tried to you know modify a Sperling uh, partial report paradigm technique and tried to find out if iconic memory works in the case of infants also, because whatever we were discussing had to do with adults. Now, in infants this very study found uh, that and even uh, for human children uh, who were just 6 months old, they could also store color related information. Okay, and up to 5 items were uh, you know, stored at the level of iconic memory. So, you can visualize that right from a very early stage in our life iconic memory vision based memory which basically serves us for a very brief period of time not more than 2 seconds time okay, plays an important role. When we meet tomorrow we would be talking about echoic memory.